to our worship today. I'm really glad that you are here. Um, as you can see, we're ready for vacation Bible school. Rochelle and, and Jessica have been working, and Kenny too, been working hard, 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 hard. And we know the kids are going to just have a fabulous time. We're going to go to Mars and beyond. Uh, and so we're already on our way. <laughs> so welcome to worship. Let's watch our video together. You may be seated. Last, last Sunday and last weekend, uh, Dennis Brejean, Martha Chancellor, and myself were at our Iowa Annual Conference. And so Dennis, as our delegate, has a report on Annual Conference for us. Well, just starting out, I said, what am I going to say about Annual Conference this year? And I was going to say, it was a heck of a conference, and I don't know if I'd want to do it again, but maybe another conference, I do that. It was five days, Friday night, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, must Sunday? Saturday. Saturday, too. <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, and Monday are 9 o'clock in the morning till 9 at night. And Tuesday was all morning long, so it's the song. But there were some outstanding messages from the bishop and from others that, that really kind of set the tone and the pace and what it was, um, it, it was good. There were collections for special projects and I don't know if you remember, we were collecting for Umbuto, the college at um, African University and they took up everything that was collected through the state as well as the collection there and they raised $45,000 and the goal was 40, so they went over, that was, that was good. Um, let's see if it works here. Yes, there were, um, oh, I left it out of my notes, but Martha got an award for being a certified lay uh, minister. She was actually there at another time too, so pastors, um, oh, I had another picture here. This is our DS happily collecting money for, I think that was for one of the collections at Umbut, uh, yeah. So he was dancing around with the bucket, but he really didn't have, they also have what are called diaconos, diac, diaconos. Diaconos. They're, they're high school kids, there's about 50 of them, I think, that walk around and do things, so they would collect the money. They know what they're doing, our DS didn't really, so <laughs> he was kind of missing out on a few people. Let's, I can't see my little pictures here to see what this is. Okay, here's where pastors Don and Rhoda were uh, recognized for the, uh, during the retirement ceremony. And that was um, Saturday night, I believe. Here you have another picture. There's the bishop greeting. Here's the bishop thanking Rhoda. And here's Rhoda, glad to be done with it. <laughs> so. <laughs> So anyway, <clears throat> there was also a very solemn ceremony, and I, I actually don't see that slide on my thing. I hope they're on there. Is there a very solemn ceremony for church closings, which included Little Cedar? Um, is there one for that showing a, the bishop or the district superintendent and a slide beside him there, Jubal? Can you see that? It's not in there. Shoot. Um, anyway, he read a, the formal declaration. Um, talking about it located in Mitchell County, founded in 1869, and had a long and proud history. There were eight other churches, there were, there were seven other churches closing this year in um, Iowa, but that was it. The Tuesday morning was probably the longest day, the most uh, it, the nerve wracking, but there were long discussions, a lot of parliamentary procedures where things have to be done just so to make it legal. Endless votes on various resolutions covering a wide variety of things over the course of the conference. But then we came to resolution number 506. They're numbered in the 100s, 200s, 300s, and so on. And this resolution was entitled Disapproval of the Traditional Plan, which was the um, general conference approved plan from February of, um, this year. So this was what the 
I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's like a whole page here and then they changed it and amended it. But the, the gist of it was, we urged the Iowa Annual Conference to express disapproval of the traditional plan. So this is not a binding legal thing. It apologizes for the harm inflicted on our LGBTQ plus persons, their families, and the body of Christ. We urge the uh, Iowa Annual Conference to affirm that all persons are individuals of sacred worth, created in the image of God, and assert that no human being is incompatible with Christian teaching. So this is not saying anything at all about where it should go. It's just trying to recognize our, um, our other LBGTQ um, persons in the church. Because in the traditional plan that was approved, it not only maintained what we already have in place now, but it actually instituted far more drastic punitive measures against these people. And that's what really upset a lot of people, is that it's okay being one thing, but then to be punishing them is another thing. So I got thinking while I was sitting there of, has there ever been other conflict in the church? And I came across this uh, reading. It's from Galatians 2, verse 11 to 14. What happened was that Paul had a public dispute with Peter. We're talking two of the apostles here. So this is the way it goes. It's the Jewish-Gentile controversy. When Cephas, or Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was wrong. But he had been eating with the Gentiles before certain people came from James, who is the brother of Jesus. But when they came, he began to back out, separate himself, because he was afraid of the people who promoted circumcision, which is the Jewish law. And the rest of the Jews also joined him in this hypocrisy, so that when Barnabas got carried away with them in their hypocrisy, I, but when I saw that they weren't acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of everyone, if you, though you're a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you require the Gentiles to live like Jews? So it sets up the whole argument for something very similar to what we're going through right now. And <clears throat> I think what they were trying to say is that these new Christians coming in, because early Christians weren't Christians, they were Jews believing what they called the way, the way of Jesus. And when they brought them in, there was a certain factor that said, you have to follow Jewish law, you have to have circumcision, you have to follow our dietary principles, the laws of Moses. So they started to do some, um, what do you call it? So or they said, okay, you don't have to follow all the laws of Moses. And they went through all these arguments going on until it was finally settled that everyone is equal and everyone is, is accepted into the Christian faith or the way. So I could say that Paul was being inclusive and Peter was being traditional, the Jewish way. So I think we have to ask ourselves if we have the heart and grace to treat all of our brothers and sisters with love. We don't have to agree with them. We don't have to accept their lifestyle or choices, but we do need to love them and accept them that way as a child of God. And I think that was the gist of what I was seeing that the, this to go to, although it may be something different. Margaret Borgen, our lay uh, leader for the district, had this slide up, which I think is really good for a framework for us to work from, using respect, openness, prayer, and honesty to talk about it so that we all know each other's feelings and so we all know what's happening and what, what's taking place. And I think together we can move through this and, and all be loved better than what we are right now. So that's... That's my summary of five long days of annual conference. And, and if you have questions, I'll, I have more information if you want to. So thank you. A number of announcements to share with you today. First of all, you noticed in your, in your bulletin there is a special offering envelope 
for peace with justice offerings. Uh, part of this money stays in our annual conference and is administered by our conference peace with justice coordinator, but part of it's used across the United States and across the world. So if you would like to give to that, uh, that envelope is available for you. We have really good news that Royal Dollar is now out of the hospital and out of rehab. Um, he and Monica will be staying in the cities for another month because he needs to be close to have uh, you know things checked on every day. Uh, but what good, good news to be out of the hospital and out of rehab. So thank you for praying and just keep on doing that. Vacation Bible School is this week, starts tomorrow. We start every night at 5.30 with supper for the children. We'll be done at a quarter till eight. Um, there are registration forms for the children uh, outside by the entry. We would just love to have the place packed with boys and girls. Wednesday of this week is the day when our moving truck comes and we'll load the truck. Um, so um, just be thinking of Don and me on Wednesday as we load the truck and on Thursday as we unload it in Cedar Rapids. Martha will be leading the communion for us at Good Sam on Thursday. You're always welcome to participate in that. Um, so next Sunday will be my last Sunday here with you, and I'm already crying about it. Um, um, and it will be the Sunday when Little Cedar has their final worship service and their closing worship service. Um, so just be thinking of them, please. On the following Monday, um, at five, Little Cedar will have an auction, um, auctioning off all of the things uh, that are remaining in the building. And so if you would like to attend that, I know they would appreciate it. Now here's something really important. We are going to switch worship times, not beginning next Sunday, but beginning June 30th. Our worship time will be at 1045. That's because <laughs> Starting that Sunday, you will be sharing a yoke with Osage, and Osage worship is going to be at 9 o'clock, and your worship here will be at 1045, and the plan is that the time changes will occur on the first Sunday in July from now on instead of on Labor Day Sunday. So, so just keep note of that. Um, if you come early, you can have a nice long time of prayer, silent, quiet prayer, while you, while you wait for the service to begin. We're gathering uh, items for health kits, so please take note of that. Do you have other joys and concerns or announcements for us today? I think a lot of people here know that Richard's sister, Mariana Stewart, passed away last Sunday morning, and her visitation is today at from 3 to 5 in Shorter's funeral home, and the funeral is tomorrow morning at uh, Okay, so we'll be keeping your family in our prayers. Yes. Did you want to say anything more about Bible school, Rochelle? No, not today. Final touches will be done today, and we'll, if anybody can volunteer to help walk groups of kids around tomorrow, that would be great. We appreciate it. Okay. And the rest of the Let's pray together a prayer of confession for Trinity Sunday. Holy and triune God, you alone live in perfect relationship. One God in three persons, mutual and loving, ever seeking reconciliation and unity. You have called us to live in your completion, yet we confess that our relationships are imperfect and we are incomplete without you. We are selfish and greedy. We are anxious and resenting. We feel the shame of our foolish behavior and brokenness. We have allowed sin to drive us apart from one another and from you. Forgive us and restore us. Draw us close and bind us together in your mercy. May we long for wholeness and peace. May we strive towards gratitude and grace. In the same name of your Son, Jesus Christ, by the working power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Our prayer hymn is Bind Us Together, which is in the faith we sing 2226.
Let's join together in silent prayer. Compassionate and powerful God, we are so glad that we can be here to worship you today. And we bring to you all of our anxieties and all of our worries and fears, all of our sorrows, all of our expectations, and we just lay them at your feet. We ask you to take care of us. We ask you to guide us and to bless us. I thank you for each person that's here today. Please be with them. Let them know that you're with them. Give them strength. Give them joy and peace and purpose. Be especially with, the, with those who are grieving today and sorrowing, Richard and his family and, and others. May the comfort of knowing that you promised eternal life for us and came so we could have eternal life, they help, help us to know that and to claim that promise. Thank you for the pie and salad luncheon yesterday, how good the food was, how beautiful it was, uh, what a good time we had fellowshipping with our community. Thank you for everyone that worked and made that possible and successful. We do ask that you particularly bless Vacation Bible School this week so children can learn to know you better and better and grow up into having a whole life uh, walking with you. As we face changes in the coming days, help us to do that with a sense of anticipation and, uh, and trust. Please bless our church, not only our local church, but our whole denomination, that we may honor you in everything that we do. And now please hear us as together we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to come up. I think if we can squeeze together on this side, maybe you could sit over here. for you today. I thought you might like to have some money. And so, I put this back in the pocket. I have for each of you a $50 bill and a $100 bill. There you go. For you and you and you and you. So, how are you going to spend your money? If you take this down to the store and they'll look at me and say, look, here's a, here's a genuine $50 bill, a genuine $100 bill. Do you think you'd be able to buy lots of stuff with this money? Is it real money? Look at it. Does it look like a real dollar bill? Do you see anything strange about this money? Is it the right color for money? No, real money doesn't really exactly blue and yellow, right? Does real money have the word monopoly written on it? No, right? What about turn it over the back? Is real money totally blank on one side? Right? So, so you know, this isn't real money. It's not going to do you much good if you go to the store, unfortunately. I wish I could have given you each at least a real $50 bill. Because, you see, if you see a real $50 bill, you'll know it doesn't look quite the same, does it? You know? A real $50 bill has a picture of a person right in the center, right? Right? And it, and it has all kinds of things like special numbers and, and a flag on, on the back of it. There's a picture of the Capitol, right? Right? But, you know, unfortunately, do you think I can know for sure this is a real, do real $50 bill? Sometimes people are not doing good things and they counterfeit money, right? And they make it look like it's money, but it's not real. But if you hold a genuine one up to the light, what there is, is there's a very faint thread that's right down about right here. And if you hold it up to the light, 
you can see it, and it's only in the genuine ones, not the fake ones. You can't see it, but you've got to trust that it's the real thing. But, but people who are official know that it's the real thing when they check it out. Now, here's the thing I wanted you to know. You have something valuable within you, and that's the God's love is living within you. People can't always tell whether God's love is living in you or not, because some people say they're Christians and, and want people to believe that they are, but inside they don't have that love of God, and it's not really there, so they're really fake. But if God is really living in you, then you'll be the genuine thing, and you really will be able to spread love in the world and make the world a better place, right? So never, never try to be a fake Christian. Ask God to be in your heart and your life and make you the real thing. Okay? Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for these children and how much you love them. Please bless their lives and give them treasures that they can't even imagine. In your name I pray, amen. If you want a clipboard to do some things, they're over there. Scripture reading today comes from Romans 8. There are some theologians who say that Romans 8 is one of the most important, greatest chapters in the entire Bible because it tells us some things that we really need to know and claim. So from Romans 8 today, I'm reading Romans 8, 12 through 17, and then 26 to 30. This is what it says. So then, my brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to live as our human nature wants us to. For if you live according to your human nature, you are going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death your sinful actions, you will live. Those who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons. For the Spirit that God has given you does not make you slaves and cause you to be afraid. Instead, the Spirit makes you God's children. And by the Spirit's power, we cry out to God, Father, my Father. God's Spirit joins himself to our spirits to declare that we are God's children. Since we are his children, we will possess the blessings he keeps for his people. And we will also possess with Christ what God has kept for him. For if we share Christ's suffering, we will also share his glory. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. And God who sees into our hearts knows what the thought of the Spirit is, because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of his people and in accordance with his will. We know that in all things, God works for good with those who love him, those whom he has called according to his purpose. Those whom God had already chosen, he also set apart to become like his son, so that the son would be the first among many brothers. And so those whom God set apart, he called, and those he called, he put right with himself, and he shared his glory with them. Here ends the reading. There's a gospel song uh, written by Bill Gaither that's called The Family of God. I found myself singing it in my head as I was thinking about the sermon, and I thought, well, let's just all sing it together. Um, so from the insert in your bulletin, let's sing together The Family of God. Maybe you should play it all the way through so people can hear it.
family of God. Let's sing it again now that you know it. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join us with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm part of the family, the family of God. My father was a big one for having his kids do chores. <laughs> I don't know how your fathers were with that, but that's what my father was like. Um, so we had chores to do every day. And on the farm, there's lots of chores to do, right? Um, one of the things we had to do in the summertime was mow the grass, and that would take all of us, you know, <laughs> several days, because we just had a push mower. We'd set the timer so we didn't get overheated, and we'd take the turns and mow, 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 mow. <laughs> Another thing that we did, starting from the time that I was in kindergarten, my family planted two shelter belts. And so from the time I was in kindergarten until I was a senior in high school, we had to go out there all the time, pull the weeds at first when the trees were little to make sure the trees could grow, and then water them because there was not easy access to water on that side of, of the road. We didn't have a well. We were dry land. Uh, and so... That's how our, my summers were spent, <laughs> from kindergarten to high school, weeding the shelter belt, watering the shelter belt, doing it over and over again, besides all of the other kinds of chores that you have to do on a farm, taking care of the animals and all the stuff you need to do, like taking care of the garden and helping mom, you know, freeze the food and cook the daily meals and so on. We had chores to do, and sometimes when we just wouldn't feel like doing it and we would complain... <laughs> My father and my mother, too, would say, now look, you're part of the family, and in the family, you know, we all have things that we need, and so we work together. We all do our part. That's what it means to be part of a family. And you know, my father and my mother, they were not taskmasters. They didn't treat us like slaves, like, you're going to do this or else. I don't care what you want, you know? I think what they really wanted deep down was us as a family to share common purposes, common goals, things that we really wanted as a family and that we all wanted. And so therefore, because we all wanted that for the benefit of our family, we were willing to work together at it because we were all on the same page, so to speak, about the things that needed to be done. You know, so, so for example, <laughs> we all wanted to eat. None of us wanted to starve to death, right? So therefore, we pitched in and worked in the garden and helped mom cook the food and wash the dishes afterwards because none of us wanted to starve, right? And also the farm that we lived on, this was the farm that was homesteaded by my, my father's parents. And, and so we had this sense of responsibility and stewardship of this land, right? And we didn't want the land to be eroded away for the winds of Nebraska to blow away that rich soil. And so we said, because... We take so seriously the fact that this is precious land and, and God has given us the stewardship of it. We will work hard to make sure that we protect the land. We worked hard enough that my daddy got the award for the county for soil and water conservation, but, but we were all part of it because we all shared the same common goal. I think that God has been interested in the very beginning in the concept of families. Because I believe that from time immemorial, from time beyond time, way before the universe was even created at all, I believe God was already in family. That there was already God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Spirit. Because when Genesis tells us the story of creation, it's, it's God speaking to the other persons of the Godhead, saying, Let, let's work together. And, and what happened, I believe, is that God the Father had his job to do. He spoke the word. And God the Spirit had his job to do. He came and hovered over the water and empowered all of creation to take place. And God the Son came 
as the light that dispelled the darkness and, and just radiated warmth and color into the world, and that they all worked together, and that this was part of God's plan, that family, even within the Godhead, brings relationship and love and trust, and everyone has his job to do, but if you all have the same purpose, you can do wonderful, godly things. So, when God decided to create human beings... I don't think that it was any surprise that God decided that he wanted to put human beings into human families. Not to be alone, but to to be families. And he created us as human families who are like God in that we can love and we can have relationship and we can have common purpose and goals and we can work together and, you know. And from the very beginning, Romans tells us, it was God's plan, God's desire that we should be molded into the likeness of his son. But here's the thing about being a human being. We might be like God in some ways and that we can be creative and that, but there are so many ways in which we are not like God. And one of those ways is that God is good all the time and as human beings, we're not. And as human beings, we have the opportunity to make choices and sometimes we make pretty rotten ones. We can be rebellious, we can be hateful, we can be unjust, we can be unkind. That's the reality of our life. And on our own, even if God wants us to be more like Jesus on our own, we can't do it. But Romans tells us that we don't have to because that's the job of the Holy Spirit. You see, God didn't just put us into human families. He wanted us to know that we are part of the family of God. And in this family, we all work together. And part of our family is the Holy Spirit who is at work in you, molding you to become more and more and more like Christ. So what's the benefit of being part of this family? Part of the benefit is that The Holy Spirit gives you the ability just simply to cry out, Father, my Father, (laughs) when that's all you can do. And when we feel lost and we just don't even know who we are or what's right or what's true or, or even if God exists, it's the Holy Spirit who declares to us, yes, God is God and he's your Father. And that Holy Spirit, Romans says, that Spirit unites with our spirits so that we can truly know that God is our God and that we are his child, so that we can know that. And and one of the benefits of having the Holy Spirit is sometimes we have needs, but we just can't even put words to it. We just don't even know what we really need or what we want, and we just sort of like, we're speechless and helpless, and, and that's when the Holy Spirit says, that's okay because I'm your family advocate. And when you have no words to speak to God, know this, I know you even better than you know yourself. I know what you need, and I'm gonna be with you all the time, and I'm gonna pray to the Father constantly on your behalf. (laughs) So that when you can't pray, God hears me praying for you, the Spirit says. And God seeing that, knows what you need, and God will do it because he's good and he loves you. We have these benefits that come from being part of the family of God, but that does not mean that as Christians, therefore, we can live on easy street, that we can expect everything to be good and happy and pleasant because, you see, as Roman tells us, What God wants for us is to grow more and more like Christ, both in his suffering and in his goodness and glory. So the thing is, I believe that as the Spirit dwells within us, making our hearts become more and more at one with God's heart, we will probably find ourselves suffering more than we've ever had before. Because with God in us and the Holy Spirit moving and working in us and changing things within us, changing our perceptive perceptions, 
we'll be able to see and recognize where, when there's injustice in the world, when there's hatred in the world, when there's evil in the world. We'll be able to, to see those things and suffer with those people and, and have the energy and the power to do what God wants us to do because it's the Spirit who empowers us because he's part of a family. And so I believe that the truth that Romans is trying to help us understand and why theologians say maybe this is the greatest chapter in the entire Bible is that for us to understand that from the very distant past, from time beyond all time, God's eternal love has reached out to us, reached down to us, you know, calling us to follow him and to walk with him into a future that's filled with hope. And how does that look like in our lives? It looks like God's love reaching down to us, down to us from heaven and becoming the firm foundation under our feet. And when we stand firm in that foundation, then we can stretch our arms out wider and wider and wider and wider to embrace all in God's love and suffer with them so that together things can change. God never promised that things would go perfectly for us and that everything would just be all happy. But God does promise us, and it's stated here in Romans, that in everything, God is at work for good. I don't think that God thought that Jesus' suffering was a good thing, that his dying was a good thing, that his pain and death on the cross was a good thing, but something really, 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 really good came out of it. And that's our salvation and our eternal life. And the things that happen in your life, you can know if you are like Christ, God will take the things that happen in your life and have the power in the end ultimately to turn them into something good so that you can have a future filled with hope. You know, when I go back to thinking about families in the story of creation, when God created families, God said to them one of the first things was be fruitful and multiply. Because you see, I think being in a family is the way that God guaranteed that there would be a future. And so one of the greatest benefits that we have as the family of God is not only the fellowship we can have with God the Father and Jesus Christ our brother and the Holy Spirit who empowers us and with one another, um, but, but we can know that together we can have a future and God promises that it's going to be glorious. And being thankful for that, I invite you to stand if you're able as we sing My Gratitude Now Accept O God in the faith we sing 2044. and we invite our ushers for our offerings.
Join with me as we read our prayer of dedication. We give our offering hopefully, hoping that you can use these gifts, hoping that these gifts can further your kingdom, hoping that your kingdom will come and your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And now let's join in the benediction based on Romans 8, 15 and 16. As you go from here, remember this. Because of the work of the Holy Spirit within us, we are sons and daughters of God. We have been adopted into his family. God is truly our father. And if we are God's children, we are his heirs and fellow heirs with Christ. So go in peace and confidence, knowing that the love of God our Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit goes with us. And now let's sing our recessional hymn, May You Run and Not Be Weary. Thank you. 